Um, some community life things, as always, let you know about. There's lots uh, going on. Be sure to check out your bulletin. But three things we wanted to highlight, let you know about. One is part of the summer rhythm of uh, our life here at Blackhawk. Our middle school students uh, do this thing in the summer. It's called Madison Missions. You know about this? So... Great. So instead of going to far off countries, there are lots of needs, practical needs, uh, right here in our own community. And so uh, this week, uh, this is part a third rotation, I think. Now, 60 middle school students are going to live downstairs during the day, during the week. Uh, they're going to sleep downstairs, but then during the day, over the next week, they're just going to be out all over the community, uh, serving in whatever soup kitchens, uh, homeless shelters, these kind of things, just being exposed to the needs in our community and also serving. So. Please pray for those of you prayer warriors for uh, our church here. Please pray for these students. Cool stuff happens in the lives of these students when they get into a new setting and are serving people in the name of Jesus. So uh, will you please pray for them? Thank you. Um, Second thing, Backpack Bonanza. So uh, we had talked about this last week. This is our second for our kind of summer drives to be a blessing to our community. And so we are purchasing backpacks and school supplies, and they get uh, connected to a number of local schools that we partner with, especially schools that have a large population of under-resourced families that can't get this kind of stuff. So uh, get the information on the table out there. You pick up a bag if you want to buy school supplies, pick up a card if you want to buy a backpack, and you bring that all where and when? Bring it here next Sunday, August 7, and then it'll be clear where you put the backpacks and school supplies and that kind of thing. Sound good? Great. Last thing um, to just kind of let us know about is uh, Chris, Pastor Chris, our senior pastor, is away on sabbatical this summer, and uh, it's two-thirds over, which he would not want me to say out loud. (laughs) So anyhow, so some of you, you may or may may not know, he's uh, kept up a blog this summer that he talks both about what he's doing, but also about what he's learning. So part of this was just to have a lot of time to be in the woods and to read his Bible a ton. And so every week he puts up short little essays about things he's reflecting on that he's learning. The web address for his blog is in your bulletin. And go there, read it. It's really uh, some profound uh, things that he's thinking through and learning this summer. So uh, keep him in your prayers as well. Sound good? Excellent. Great. Okay. Uh, Story time. Can I tell you a story? I'm going to tell it anyway. So it's not not like your yes matters. But anyway, there you go. But thank you for responding. So story time. Um, Some of you know my wife and I uh, moved here to Madison eight years ago uh, so I could enter graduate school at UW. And uh, during part of our season of grad school was uh, we lived at Eagle Heights in student housing, you know, apartments, Eagle Heights. Any Eagle Heights residents here today? Oh, yeah. One. There we go. Video? You guys in video? Okay, I'm sure there's... I know, maybe they all come in the evening. I don't know. Or they all go downtown. Anyhow, so Eagle Heights, wonderful place to live. Love the international community there, people from all over the world living there. And we also loved the huge community gardens that exist right on the UW Forest property right next. Do you guys know about the Eagle Heights community gardens? Have you been there before? Unbel acres, acres. And there's just loads of walking trails along the lakeshore down there. It's beautiful. So here's an aerial photo of one of the Eagle Heights community gardens. There's a whole other one. And uh, so when we moved in, we got a little plot. And, uh, you know, April, May, we got busy. This is Jessica's dream come true. She loves gardening. This was my first experience. I was free labor, right? So she paid, paid me with lemonade and so on. So Uh, This was our little plot, and uh, it was just a mess when we first got it. So, you know, did the weeding, put down mulch and leaves, and then had it rototilled. And then April, May, we got got, uh, down to business. And so my job, she created this map and planted all the things, peppers, beans, peas, zucchini, cucumber, this kind of thing. And my job was to, like, create all the rows and do all the, the digging and to create this little geometric thing you see before you. And in my humble opinion, this was the most beautiful plot in the row. (laughs) I I was so proud of this and it was like great, took pictures of it. We thought this was such a great, such a great thing. So uh, as we do every summer, late June, and uh, we go visit our families, which are in the uh, the Northwest Portland, Seattle area. And so we were gone for a little over two weeks, late June. And uh, when we got back to our garden, there had been much growth, (laughs) much growth in the garden. But what's the problem, of course? is that we didn't plant most of what uh, we discovered that was growing here. So here's at least just one of those rows. 
what? So again, I'm naive, green thumb. This is my first experience. And I was so ticked off when we got back. I was like, you have to be kidding me. Where are the plants? Like you can't even spot the plants among, among the weeds. So here's what I wanted to do. Can you guess what I wanted to do? You see it underneath the piano, don't you? <laughs> what I wanted to do was go purchase the Black & Decker Grasshog String Weed Whacker. Okay? Now let's say, let's say, oh, let's put the guard down. All right. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's say I waltz into the garden. Just charge in. Where, Rambo? I'm so ticked off. I want to protect my time and energy investment, and I just go to town. What's going to happen? Will I get rid of the weeds? What will I also get rid of? <laughs> I, like everything that's growing. Everything that's growing. The cucumbers. And so, so let's say I charge in here. Jessica's response will be to me, you know, of course, like, stop, you fool. What are you doing? <laughs> like, this, you're going to destroy everything. You're going to botch the job. And she's right, of course. And well, here's what else would happen. What else would happen is I'd charge in, and yes, I would be vigorously like whacking at the weeds, but then I would see like the lima beans. And I hate lima beans, you know? <laughs> and so how convenient, how easy might it be to, you know, oh, it's like no lima beans this winter, you know? And so what? So what? I am, I am not qualified for this job. You can certainly say that. It's not what Jessica asked me to do. It's not what I'm good at. You know what I mean? She asked me to do what she told me to do. That's what she asked me to do. And that's my role in, in assisting the, the master gardener. I'm not qualified to whack the weeds with this thing. I will botch the job and, and ruin. I'll ruin everything. The kingdom of God is like this little garden scenario that I've just described to you. How many of you have ears? should listen. You should listen. I invite you to get out your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew, Matthew chapter 13. We are continuing on in this series. Can I put the grass hog here for display? Uh, we are continuing in the series called uh, Parables of the Kingdom. And we are exploring this kind of core main message of Jesus. If you were to hear him on any given day, if you had to summarize all of Jesus' teaching in one sentence or two, what would it be? What would it have to do with? The kingdom, the kingdom of God. So it's a broken record. We're going to do this every week because this is like the core of what Jesus was all about. So Mark chapter 1 verse 15, this is uh, the gospel of Mark's way of summarizing everything Jesus taught about and said. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is where? It's here. We're not, it's not something that you go to that's far away. It's not far off. It's here now. And so how should we respond to the presence, the dawn of the kingdom? Repent, change your ways, adapt to this new reality Turn from your sins and believe, believe in the good news. And so we've been uh, using this image to depict what Jesus is getting at here about this overlap of the old creation and the new creation. This is the biblical story that Jesus is announcing here. So we live in this old, broken world. We have lots of old, broken sin and selfishness inside of us. And God's on a mission to redeem that. And so this new creation, the kingdom of God, the world as God intends it to be, has come crashing into our old broken one. God's birthing a new creation right here in the midst of the old one. And it centers in Jesus, in his announcement of the kingdom, and in his activity, and in the movement that he started. And so in this series, we are tackling each week different parables that Jesus told, little short stories to unpack the implications. What does it mean to live in the midst of this overlap? the season of overlap of the old age and the new age, because that is where we live. And so this parable we're looking at today is another angle on being a follower of Jesus in the season of the kingdom. Let's jump in. Verse 24, chapter 13. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven, which is the same thing as the kingdom of God, just two ways of saying the same thing. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, 
His enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. And so the owner's servants, they came to him and they said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. And the servants asked him, Should we get the grass hog out? <laughs> right? Should we get the weed whacker? Do you want us to go and pull them all up? No. No, he answered. Nope. Because while you are pulling the weeds, you may also uproot the wheat along with them. No, no. Let them grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds, tie them in bundles to be burned, and then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. And that's the story. Now, Jesus will explain the story uh, in just a few verses down, and we'll turn there in a second. But that's, that's the story that he told, that he told to the crowds. What is going on here? So we can pick up at least one main idea, big picture here. Right now... Is the season of the kingdom that's all about growing wheat. All about growing wheat. But there are also problems as the wheat growing project moves forward, right? There are weeds. There are weeds. Jesus is speaking to this reality. God is up to something. He's growing something new in our world. And Jesus claimed that it was happening through him, his announcement of the kingdom. But then there's, there's also immense good and life and grace coming into the world in a new and fresh way, but there is also a lot of weeds growing too. There is still evil in the world and tragedy and violence. And what is God's response? What is Jesus' response to the presence of weeds? Should Jesus and his followers go around starting whacking weeds everywhere they find them? No, 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 no. You'll botch the job. (laughs) You'll botch the job. Your responsibility if you're associated with this farmer, is to grow wheat and to wait for the farmer to sort things out. That's, that's the story. So what does this mean? Why would Jesus need to tell a story like this? He needed to tell stories like this. And there's a backstory here. So Jesus, when he goes around announcing the good news of the kingdom, like what he said here in Mark chapter 1, this is not news to people. A lot of people already have in their minds what the kingdom of God is all about. This is the cherished hope that the Jewish people derive from the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew scriptures. And the hope of the kingdom of God, in most of Jesus' listeners, if you were to create another drawing, might uh, look something like this. So yes, we have our old creation here that's kind of, it's messed up, it's screwed up, full of sin and dysfunction. And you have God's new creation, the way he intended the world to be. What's the transition between the old creation and the new going to be like? Between uh, uh, the brokenness and the healing of our world, the coming of God's kingdom. And so you read the Hebrew Bible, you read Jewish writings from Jesus' time period, and this hope was alive and well. Messiah is going to come, the king from the line of David. He's going to march into Jerusalem. He's going to establish a new kingdom, regather all the scattered people of Israel. He's, he's going to run out all of those tax collectors, first century mafia, you know, and the sex workers and the sinners and, and the unclean. And he's going to form an army, kick out those Romans for sure, kill them all, and then establish a kingdom of peace and justice over all nations and so on. That's the basic hope. And Jesus comes onto the scene and he says, no, no, not so much. (laughs) Yes, I am announcing the kingdom of God, but it's different. It looks different than what you thought. It looks like this. It's this slow transition. It's this season of overlap where the old and the new creation exist together, where the brokenness and the healing exist together in our own lives and in our world. And right now, in this season of the kingdom, it, it's about growing wheat. God is changing people into wheat. And God will bring final justice one day, where the weeds are sorted out, but that time is not now. That time is not now, Jesus says. What does this mean? What are the implications of this for being a follower of Jesus? Let's turn back to the parable. Let's unpack a few things here. 
Look at the question that uh, the servants come and ask, ask the owner, the farmer. Look at verse 27. The weeds appear. And what's the first question that they ask? Verse 27. Where did the weeds come from? Like, where did they come from? Didn't, I, hold on. I thought your intentions were to grow wheat. Where did all of these weeds come from? Has anyone ever asked a similar question before? Right? So this is, Jesus is hitting nail on the head here. So if God really is in charge of the world, if the kingdom is really here, why is the world still full of so much evil and tragedy and pain? What is, God, what is happening here? Where did it come from? And Jesus gives a very simple answer. What is his answer in the parable? An enemy did this. And that answer is almost totally unsatisfactory to most of us, right? So what do you mean? What do you mean? Like, let's hear more about that. To which the Bible says, right? So where, where did evil come from? Why is it here? And you read the biblical narratives and the biblical authors are just not concerned to answer that question for us. The core biblical insight that Jesus gives here and that the scriptures give elsewhere is that evil is an invader in God's world. It's not part of what he wanted for his world, that it's a parasite, a corrupting force, and that evil is not just the sum total of all the horrible things that we do and think about each other, though that is evil, that there's a darker, deeper mystery at work. In, in, in evil in our world, that it's a personal reality that transcends any human or human institution in the ways that we perpetrate evil. This is a core biblical insight. There are unseen forces at work. And we say, tell us more about that, Jesus. And he says, nope, <laughs> nope. That's not the purpose of the Bible. The purpose of the Bible is to tell us, not where evil came from or why it's here, it's to tell us what God is doing about evil in the world. That's the story of the Bible. And that's the next question that uh, the, the servants asked. The next question they asked, so, okay, the weeds are here. What do you want us to do? Can we get the grass hog? Can we get the grass hog out? Right? Can we get this thing out? Come on, come on. You can, they're like salivating. You know what I'm saying? Do you want us to come on, Let me go pull them up, pull them up, pull them up. Why would, why would people be so eager <laughs> to start whacking weeds, right? Well, you know, I got this neighbor and I'm pretty sure he's a weed. You know what I'm saying? Like, because <laughs> he lets his dog out late at night, he's barking. I got his coworker, definitely a weed, right? So come on, Jesus, you're the Messiah. Let's do the cleanup job here, right? You and me, you and me. Can I be party captain in your army? You know, this kind of thing. So that's, that's, Jesus knows that's what people are thinking. When he goes around proclaiming the kingdom, he attracts crowds and they're saying, oh, I probably want to get on this guy's good side because this is Messiah, he's going to bring the hammer, right? He's going to start whacking weeds. And Jesus says, no, it's not what I'm about right now. And that's not what I want my followers to be about. Don't uproot the weeds. Why? Why? There's a little detail here that we miss in our English translations. Jesus is uh, listeners would have got it really quickly. So the word that the Jesus used for weeds, it's, we think of dandelions or something like that. That is not what Jesus is talking about. The word that he uses is the word zidzania. Zidzania. It's a good tongue twister. Why don't you say it with me? Zidzania. There's some uh, pictures of zidzania here. Zidzania is known in English as darnell or old English uh, tares. It's, it's called false wheat. So uh, you look at wheat on the left there. This is uh, kind of early wheat, I think. I'm not a farmer, but uh, at least that's what I think is early wheat. And uh, so it's still green. These aren't amber waves of grain yet. Right? So, so it's still green. And the heads of grain are still kind of new on the wheat there. You would have come, I don't know, two weeks, a month earlier, and you would see the wheat, but minus the heads of grain there. On the, on the right, you see uh, the, the darnel, the false Wheat. Now, a month ago, without the heads of grain on the wheat, how similar does the wheat look to the weeds? Very similar. Very similar. Almost identical in the early phases of growth. When can you tell the wheat apart from the weeds? Look at verse 26. When are the weeds exposed for what they really are? Not... When the servants go around saying, weed, 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 you're a weed, you're a weed. How, how do you know? How do you know what the weeds are? 
When the wheat sprouts and forms heads, then the weeds also appeared. It's when the wheat becomes fully wheat, that's when the weeds are exposed from what they are. In the early phases, you have no idea. And so Jesus is saying, good and evil are a lot more complex and intermixed and intermingled in our world than we like to think, right? The line that divides good and evil goes down right the middle of every single one of us. None of us is wholly good. None of us is wholly evil. And so am I going to be a good judge of who's a wheat and who's a weed in the world? Am I? I hate lima beans. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to take them out, you know, because I just don't like them. So it's not a weed, but I don't, you know what I'm saying? He knows this. He knows that if he entrusts his followers with the responsibility of being weed police, that it will go horribly wrong. Horribly wrong. That's not the responsibility and the role of the kingdom right now in this overlap of the ages. Right now, the kingdom is about growing wheat. It's growing wheat. Okay, what what does this mean? This is a metaphor, of course, growing wheat. So what does this mean? Let's, Let's unpack this. I think the implications are actually really vast and staggering if we are willing to go there. So what Jesus is speaking to was what is the role of the community of his followers in the world? What is the kingdom of God's response to evil in the world at this time? Is it to whack weeds? It's to grow wheat. What, do, what does that mean? So you can read the gospel of Matthew. And you, what does this look like for Jesus to grow wheat? So he goes about announcing the arrival of the kingdom, right? That, that God's new world is here. The way that God designed us to live, God's taken an initiative and is offering the opportunity for, for, for us a whole new way to be human. Is this good news? Well, it depends on how steeped you are in your old creation ways, right? It depends on if your mind and heart is so shaped by sin and selfishness, then the good news of the kingdom is actually bad news because it will expose all of the brokenness and junk inside of you. But the moment it does that, it is also good news at the same time because it says if, if, if you're willing to respond, to repent, to turn, God is right there to meet you in your brokenness and to convert you into wheat. <laughs> Change you from a weed into wheat. This is the announcement of the kingdom. So Jesus goes about announcing this, this message and everywhere he goes, every little town, little village, some people respond to the message and their lives are totally changed by their encounter with Jesus. They form little communities and you read chapters 5 through 7 of Matthew. This is how Jesus wanted his followers to live in these little Jesus communities and they go and share the message of the kingdom with their friends, with their family and some people listen and they're changed and transformed and it begins to spread and it begins to spread. The wheat grows, people's lives being changed and transformed by the grace of Jesus. And so here we are 2,000 years later on the other side of the planet. I'd say the wheat has been growing. <laughs> yeah, Wheat's been growing. And so this is what Jesus wants his followers to be about. How do you respond to evil in the world as a follower of Jesus? What did Jesus say? Not the way of the old creation of violence and revenge. No, no. You love your enemies. You pray for people who are opposed to you. You create communities for forgiveness and generosity and share the good news. And this thing just goes viral. (laughs) Just spreads, just spreads. That's the mission of the kingdom right now. Which doesn't mean that God is doing nothing about evil in the world. So the scriptures are, are very clear that there are institutions in place ordained by God to keep evil in check. In our world, Paul in Romans chapter 13, he calls these the governing authorities, right? It's the responsibility of governing authorities to keep evil in check, to bring order and and justice. And do all human governments do an equally good job of doing this? (laughs) No. Some do a better job, some do a worse job, some don't do that job at all. But those are the institutions in place right now to keep evil in check in the church. The community of Jesus is not, not one of them. Our response to evil in the world is to be very different. It's to be determined by the teachings of Jesus. And Jesus says, my followers are about the wheat growing program right now in the world. 
It's about the message of the kingdom, people's lives being transformed, spreading, spreading, Jesus community, spreading, little outposts of new creation going, spreading, spreading, spreading. That's the mission of the kingdom right now. Because just imagine what would happen if the community of Jesus' followers took upon itself the responsibility to become the weed police of the world. Oh wait, maybe that's happened a time or two. <laughs> right? And so what usually happens, especially in periods of church history where Christ followers begin to use force or violence to enforce like the teachings of Jesus? Are you kidding me? <laughs> but it's totally happened. This totally happened. And I think in our cultural setting, it takes a, a different form where it takes the form of Christ followers just criticizing people who don't follow Jesus for not following Jesus. <laughs> and so it's like we expect every, people who don't actually follow Jesus to live according to the teachings of Jesus, and that's what we're going to talk to them about? Like, what? <laughs> it seems to me we're supposed to be announcing the good news of the kingdom <laughs> and have a different kind of conversation. Jesus didn't appoint his followers to be the weed police of the world. He, he doesn't want us to focus on who's a weed and what's a weed. Because here's the fact. We're bad judges of determining wheat from weeds, aren't we? The story's not over. It's not until each of us is on, is on our deathbed before God that that story is fully told. We can't look into people's hearts. We don't actually know who's wheat and who's a weed. We don't know. I, I can't even tell inside myself half the time. You know what I'm saying? It's... This is not our job. It's not our job. And so, and so Jesus, this is the program of the kingdom. Growing wheat. Announcing the good news of the kingdom. Jesus sends out his followers into the world to be a part of the wheat growing project. And how easy is it to grow wheat among weeds? How many of you have tended a garden before? Is it easy to grow a healthy, flourishing garden? No, it takes immense patience. It takes diligence, right? And what's going to carry you through? What's going to carry you through those times of hardship where it's difficult, where you don't want to flourish as wheat, where you don't even want to be wheat yourself, much less help, help anyone else get there? To answer that, to give people hope and courage in the wheat growing project, he explains the parable. Go down to verse 36. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, uh, Will you explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field? It wasn't totally self-evident, Jesus. So can you help us out? He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. This is Jesus' favorite uh, title to refer to himself. The son of man. There's a whole, this is a whole like, message and teaching series in and of itself. It's, he gets this term from the book of Daniel, in the Hebrew Bible, book of Daniel chapter 7. And the Son of Man is uh, a figure of the Messiah who comes to reign and bring justice to the whole world. And so, the one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is what? The world. The good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil, that personal presence of evil in our world. The harvest is the end of the age. The harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun. This image also from Daniel, Daniel chapter 12. Shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Do you have ears? How many of us have ears right now? You should listen. Remember this is Jesus' phrase. Say cookies are not on the bottom shelf. Don't be lazy. Think this one through. Think it through. So there's a whole lot going on here. Let's link the two parts of the parable here first, first off. What is Jesus' point? Jesus' point is he's sending out his followers to grow wheat among weeds, to be light in the midst of darkness. And that is a very difficult task. It's very difficult. Right? So especially people who are sold out to following Jesus, who are looking for opportunities to grow wheat, it will lead us into the, the, the darkest, the most weedy places in the world or in our lives. 
And so how easy is it to address the dark skeletons in our closets? How easy is it to help a friend through a crumbling marriage or recovery out of addiction? It's incredibly trying, it's testing, it's difficult. How easy is it to go out in the love and the grace of Jesus and to do something about, about poverty or hunger in our communities, to help people out of gangs, to address domestic abuse or sex trafficking, whatever. That's what Jesus wants his followers to be doing. Go into the darkness, be light. Go into the weeds, grow wheat. And if you're doing this, you will be tempted to give up because it's difficult, it's hard, you will face opposition. And Jesus, in this parable, is trying to give his followers hope and courage. Yes, the world is full of weeds and wheat right now. Will it always be this way? No. The kingdom is here, growing wheat. One day, the weeds will be removed entirely. Evil will be dealt with. Jesus will have victory over evil. And this is how the biblical story consummates. That should give hope to people who are growing wheat among the weeds. But here's the reality. The reality is, in our cultural setting, we're not able to hear that message because <laughs> we're caught up here at verses 41 and 42 with these images of fire, right? And blazing furnace and weeping of gnashing of teeth. And we're like, God's final justice and fire and, and hell and whoa, this is all a bit extreme for me. <laughs> Are you guys tracking with me? So this, this is... the issue in our cultural setting that comes up when we read this parable and we miss the point that Jesus is making altogether. And so this is an important issue. This is an important issue. The Bible's teaching on, on final justice. And part of what makes this challenging is that most of the biblical authors use imagery and metaphors when they talk about the reality of God's final justice. So you have darkness or fire or weeping and what is... What does this mean? So I can't, I can't hope to address it here because that's not what this message is about. So uh, a few resources for you. A year and a half ago, Chris and I did a, a teaching series on hard questions that come up when you think through the gospel and the Christian faith. And so I did a whole message, a whole teaching on hell, sorting through different Bible passages, images, and so on. After that, Chris and I did a live Q&A session where we uh, just talked about even more questions from the audience and so on. We're putting both of those uh, resources back up on the sermon page this week. So I encourage you, this is a real issue for you. You want to think through it, get set aside some time this week, open your Bible, and uh, use those resources. And I think, I think they'll help you. In our setting, I think the core issue is this. Here's the bottom line. In our Western, kind of democratic, rights-oriented culture, our highest values are equality and fairness. And so we read these parts of the Bible and our biggest concern is, is this fair? Is God going to be fair? This seems unfair to me, some of these images, and I don't, I don't get it. And I think we can speak to that question really simply, really clearly. Do we have reason to believe that the creator and re redeemer God will be fair when he brings final justice to our world? Answer? Absolutely, absolutely. That's why he's not going to give the job to us. <laughs> Do you see that? That's why he's not going to give the job to us, because we'll botch the job. He's the one who can see into people's hearts. He knows the story behind the story, and he will do what is right when he sets all things right in our world. And that is supposed to give us hope as followers of Jesus. And so here's what I think is kind of the sad irony is that there's a lot of protest in our culture, Western Christian culture, against the idea of God's judgment or hell or final justice and this kind of thing. And there's a sad irony here, I think, is because these, these images, a parable like this, is meant to give Christ followers hope. But we'll, it will only give you hope if you're actually out there growing wheat and facing opposition and tempted to give up. Because if you're not, well then this just seems also like severe and extreme. So here we are, Western, like Christians, and like most of us are not persecuted for our faith. I doubt you received a death sentence this week for being followers of Jesus. You know, for the most part, it's just kind of, we're the most comfortable Christians in Christian history. And we kick back against this idea. But let's take a field trip. Let's go visit some followers of Jesus uh, who are gutting it out and have sold everything, sold out for the wheat growing program. Here's a, a picture of a couple, uh, Yusuf and Fatuna Nadarkani. 
and they are followers of Jesus. Uh, they live uh, in a town called Rasht. It's a few hundred miles north of Tehran. Where's Tehran? It's in the country of Iran. Uh, Yusuf and Fatuna, they're pastors of a church in their town. And a month ago, June 28th, uh, they were arrested by the government police uh, and they were tried by uh, the Supreme Court of Iran for treason. For treason, because they have been sharing the good news of Jesus in their neighborhood. Fatuna has been given a life sentence in prison and Yusuf has been given a death sentence, death by hanging. Five days later, on July 3rd, I mean, this is like not, not even a month ago, uh, the Supreme Court of Iran issued a condition that he will be spared if he recants and rejects his faith in Jesus. And that's the last anybody's heard. And if you want to know more about their story, go to the website there, persecution.com, and you'll hear dozens of more stories like this. So let's do a field trip. Let's visit Yusuf and Fatuna in the prison cell and let's read them this parable. Do you think the questions they'll be asking when we finish reading the parable are, oh, it seems so extreme that God would bring and hold everyone accountable for their behavior, that God is going to bring justice to those who oppose and reject what he's doing in the world? Do you think that's the question they're going to ask? No, what they're going to say is... That's what I need to hear. That will bring courage and hope. That however much they've lost, however much they've given up, Jesus has the final victory over evil in our world. Can I get an amen? And I'm not the one who's qualified to say what that should look like. I will botch the job. But Jesus will, will do it right. He'll be just. He'll be fair. And that should bring hope. Should bring hope. That's what this biblical teaching should do. So this is one of those biblical teachings, it's like last week, where it will only make sense to you if you are actually following Jesus and growing wheat in the midst of weeds. Then the teaching makes sense and it brings hope. But if I'm just kind of doing whatever with my life and I'm not really growing wheat in myself, I don't really care, whatever, Jesus, yeah, whatever, then of course this is going to seem bizarre and extreme because you're not actually following Jesus. And so I think this is the challenge that this parable gives to us. For those of us who are more interested in our lives and building our own little kingdom, this parable gives a challenge. It's saying, what are you doing with your life? You know? Are you going to be a part of the wheat growing project? Are you allowing God to deal with the weeds inside of you that he can use you to grow wheat elsewhere in the world and in the lives of other people? It's a challenge. What's your life about? There are others of us who are totally sold out to the wheat growing project and you're getting tired and you're tempted to give up because it's hard. It takes a lot of work. It takes patience and diligence. And in this parable, Jesus is saying to you, he's saying, don't give up. Have patience. Have hope. I will deal with the weeds. Right now, your job is to be faithful and to trust. So I don't know how this is a word of God to you today. It speaks a word of challenge and to comfort, depending on where you're at and what you bring in the doors. But I would challenge you to let, to let Jesus speak to you. If you have ears, you should listen to what Jesus is saying. We close us uh, with a word of prayer. God, we, uh, we just think of our brothers and sisters across the world who... Uh, who truly are suffering, who are being forced to give all, to follow you and to join the Wheat Growing Project. We pray for Yusuf and Fatuna, even specifically, God. We pray you give them strength and hope. And whatever uh, their fate turns out to be, God, we pray that you would be doing a work of grace in their hearts. And God, we give our own lives to you. We want to have a broader vision of what you're doing in the world and of how you want to use us to grow wheat and to be a part of what your kingdom is doing in the world. Would you give us challenge and hope uh, through your word today? And we can pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.